AI is the first time ever that uh, computer software and hardware can do both our cognitive uh, as well as our physical uh, labor. It's replacing simple parts of our brain as well as our hands and eyes and feet for various types of tasks. Uh, that has not happened before. Uh, you can, if you look at you know, automobiles, um, it didn't totally replace us. In fact, it replaced horses and carriages and the jobs shifted from the driver of a carriage to the driver of a car. So there's a one-to-one -one transformation. With AI, it, it, it could be. It doesn't have to be, but it could be a pure decimation of jobs. That is, certain types of job can just now be done by AI. For example, visual inspection in factories. Uh, for example, uh, people who copy and paste a spreadsheet and file and refile uh, documents, whether electronically or physically, those jobs AI can, can do now. And when AI does it, there isn't another job created. So I do agree with that. But I don't uh, agree that AI will not create uh, many more new jobs. It's just that we don't know what they are. Um, for example, when internet was created, it actually ended up creating a lot of jobs more than we ever thought including many jobs that we couldn't possibly imagine. For example, uh, the job of an Uber driver. Right? There are tens of millions of such drivers in the world now providing wonderful employment, but when, when internet was invented, none of us could have predicted that drivers would be one of the jobs created by internet. So similarly, AI will create a lot of jobs. We just don't, don't know what they're going to be. So we should have that optimism. Those jobs will come out. We should, as they come out, we should help facilitate the training. Uh, but I, I, I think they, they, they will definitely emerge. So in my book, AI Superpowers, um, I predicted that uh, about 40% of the jobs and tasks that we do uh, can be automated in the next 15 years. Uh, while we have gone through many waves of new technologies uh, displacing and changing the job market, uh, this time it's a little more difficult. First, the numbers are a little large. 40% is a significant percentage. Secondly, the jobs that are displaced are routine jobs generally less skilled works. And then the new jobs that will get created are skilled jobs. So there is a training gap that exists. Uh, and, and governments that are willing to look at how to help this transition uh, be more harmonious and uh, smooth needs to look at what are the job categories that are likely to be displaced and what are the new jobs that would be emerging and essentially help the process of retraining the people. And I realized that many governments and countries are looking at uh, not very high unemployment numbers, so they're not yet alarmed. But even if you don't think the numbers are that large, um, there will definitely be routine jobs eliminated uh, and new jobs created with a skill set mismatch. For example, we can easily foresee that uh, the, the many of the jobs in manufacturing and uh, back office uh, are going to be displaced. And we see also uh, very clearly healthcare services is one of the segments that are growing. So if governments can do more diligence on um, a larger set of jobs that are impacted and a set of jobs that are needed and create training programs and perhaps pay for them, uh, out of the governmental budgets. Uh, that would be one of the things that uh, governments can do. Governments can also encourage corporations to provide this kind of training. Uh, for example, it might be more um, helpful if each company take, to take care of its employees provides the training within the company. And in that case, the role government can play is perhaps to give some tax rebate for corporations that have their own training. So the corporation uh, bears part of the cost and the government uh, helps subsidize another, another part. Uh, there are also people talking about more extreme measures such as uh, universal basic income, that is just giving everybody money. Uh, I think uh, I'm actually uh, quite uh, cautious about that approach because when you give people money, there's no guarantee they will apply it to training 
to upskilling. Uh, in fact, there's a high likelihood it might be used for games, entertainment, or even alcohol and drugs and addiction. So I think uh, um, the money given to people needs to be directed to ways where people can, uh, can prepare themselves for the next step in their career. Uh, there are similarities. Uh, both are funded by venture capital. Both use the secondary stock market as exit. They both have entrepreneurs who raise money, Series A, Series B, C. So that part is similar. Uh, the, the, the China competitive landscape is quite different. I think the American uh, entrepreneurs want to do their thing and they don't, they feel it, uh, they're frowned upon uh, using ideas of other people. Uh, so, uh, so a company like Snapchat would like to build its product and um, it feels uh, it doesn't want to copy features from uh, Instagram, for example. Uh, so China is different in the sense that uh, everything, everyone should learn from everyone. Everything that is not intellectual property protected can be uh, looked at, examined, and used. So the Chinese products tend to be a collection of ideas. Some are original, some are borrowed from other Chinese companies, others are borrowed from American companies, aggregated in a super app that's quite useful. Uh, the other difference is that uh, the American uh, competition is relatively gentlemanly in the sense that, in the, in, for example, when you look at the food area, uh, Open Table, Groupon, Yelp, Grubhub, are not competing too much with each other. In China, all of these companies compete and then to create a winner-take-all super app. And I think the, 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 the outcome is when you create that super app, in China it's called Meituan for food, WeChat for, um, for uh, social and communications. When you create that super app, it is a convenience for the user because everything you need is in it. It's fewer clicks away, it's well organized. It has all your friends in it, so it's very convenient. Um, and also creates an ecosystem where people can connect with other people and information and products, very, very convenient. Um, and and uh, the downside, of course, is that it could stifle competition. Uh, so that's the, the Chinese ecosystem tends to create super apps, uh, create great convenience for the user, and, and they get to super apps by intense competition with um, tenacious entrepreneurs who play in the winner-take-all environment. Uh, in some sense, I think that model better matches the internet, where if you have a foundational platform with a super app that people can use and really live in it, uh, the, that's what the, the internet, that fits the internet model uh, pretty well. Uh, as long as there are some controls for excessive monopoly extension and uses of the monopolistic power uh, unfairly, then I think the China model is uh, very much worth studying uh, by business schools, by other countries, by other VCs and other ecosystems. China will make as much impact and extract as much value from AI as the United States. In pure research innovations, uh, US will still lead uh, the world. Uh, but in terms of implementation and value creation, China will move very quickly and China has a bigger pace with more users. Uh, so in terms of the global uh, use of Chinese and American technologies, uh, it used to be everyone in the world used American technologies. I think for the last few years, for the first time, we saw some Chinese software um, make uh, successful uh, strides in other countries. Uh, one example is Ant Financial, Alipay. Another example is ByteDance's TikTok. Uh, and there will be many, many others. So I think that just sig signals that the China companies and technologies uh, have matured to a point that they are competitive with their American counterpart. And um, we should expect more Chinese software to be exported to more countries over time. Uh, however, most likely, uh, American software will continue to be more successful in developed countries and Chinese software's opportunity is in developing countries. And the reason is really twofold. The first reason is that uh, American companies tend to uh, deprioritize developing countries. So they don't care as much about 
how it's used in India, Indonesia, uh, Brazil, Middle East, or Africa. Uh, but the Chinese uh, developers are willing to put more energy and localize uh, for these countries. The second reason is demographics. Uh, developed countries, the people, the civilization, the culture, the habits, the, even the language, is more similar with the US. Uh, so that includes Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and most of Europe, and Japan. Uh, but the developing countries, their demographics, uh, young, relatively less uh, resources and money, um, big interest in entertainment uh, and social, those kinds of habits and games uh, in developing countries better match China because China uh, five or ten years ago very much rep is similar to what India, Indonesia, and other countries are today. So Chinese software is likely to be more successful in these developing countries. So we will end up seeing both US and Chinese software as quite successful, but probably to different extent in different countries. Well, I don't think it's a question of want to. I don't think we ever really have choice on technologies. And when a technological tidal wave comes, whether it's electricity, internet, or AI, we have to just accept it's coming. What we can do is prepare ourselves for the issues and try to solve the problems that it brings about. For AI, the biggest problems people see today are uh, privacy, uh, security, uh, bias, uh, lack of uh, transparency, the black box nature of AI, and of course um, job displacement by AI and automation, as well as uh, wealth inequality. Each of this requires a different set of solutions. Uh, on privacy, I think we need both regulations um, uh, and all kinds of regulations, um, as well as uh, technological solutions. Uh, for example, uh, when electricity was, uh, became popular, uh, people got electrocuted and circuit breakers were invented. When internet were connect, was connected to PCs, viruses uh, spread to PCs and then antivirus software was created. So we need some kind of technological approach to deal with the privacy problems and the same with security. When security, for example, deep fake and um, uh, people hacking into AI models. So again, those need to be addressed, much like the security software or the antivirus software. Uh, in terms of uh, bias and the transparency, we need to invest in technologies that help AI explain itself and also help AI developers uh, be aware when there might be bias created in the software. Most of the bias is created uh, as a result of having un imbalanced uh, training set. So if you have a training set with 95% men, 5% women, it might end up discriminating or at least not representing uh, women in terms of the, uh, the, the predictions of the, of the model. So I think that the, the engineers and developers need to be trained that transparency, explainability are an important part of developing AI. And then tools need to be developed to try to catch these problems before they become really bad. And there's awareness and education. And then lastly, on uh, job displacement and uh, wealth inequality, uh, I think uh, um, several steps need to be uh, considered. One is a shift of the wealth because the rich is getting richer, the poor is getting poorer, um, <clears throat> partly because of technology, and now it will be exacerbated by AI. So how to provide a, a, a acceptable transfer of wealth from the newly created super rich uh, to help the people whose jobs might be lost or replaced. So that wealth transfer it needs to be um, uh, designed for each different country may take a different approach uh, to deal with that problem. Also, jobs retraining are needed. Uh, always governments should watch for what kind of jobs are emerging uh, as a result of AI and what jobs are emerging as a result of society with AI. These include not just uh, high-end jobs like um, data, uh, data scientists and AI engineers, but also we're going to need a lot of robot repair people and we're going to need people who label data uh, and we're going to need um, 
uh, services jobs because people will live longer, so they will, so more people should go into services, uh, not into doing routine work. So I think a systematic way to examine what jobs are being created, either by AI technology or as a result of society evolving, aging, and so on, um, and making sure that our schools and vocational training and also government subsidies are applied so that enough people are moving into these jobs. Uh, finally, there are social issues with respect to uh, some of these jobs. For example, service jobs, let's say a nanny or elderly care. In most countries, that's not considered the most desirable or highest paid job. So what can be done to entice people to go into these job categories? Uh, does there need to be professional companies with career path for people in these professions? Or does it need to be a minimum wage for these jobs? Um, or does there need to be social re-education for people to respect these people who are helping other people. So unless the social status and the pay is fixed, it's very hard just to say we want to retrain people to be nannies in elderly care. Uh, and all of these things I think are challenging and difficult, but they can be done and must be done uh, so that the world will embrace AI with much, much more benefits than downside. China has been a very different market with different language, user habits. So that has been uh, one inhibitor for European companies to enter. Uh, going forward, um, I think new opportunities will arise. Because of the US-China tension, uh, there will be uh, Chinese companies that will uh, prefer or even be required to select European technologies. For example, Huawei is currently unable to use some American technologies. So now is a good chance for the European substitute to supply to Huawei. Uh, so while I, I don't like US-China tension, but that tension does generate opportunities uh, for, for Europe. And um, I, I think China will um, open uh, its market to more, to the whole world. Uh, so whatever U.S. was able to achieve in helping China open its market, I think the same will apply for Europe. So there are multiple benefits. Uh, the, the major question I would ask is that uh, there are a lot of great existing large European companies. I think they will stand to benefit. Uh, I am a little worried about European entrepreneurs. Uh, if you look at uh, European small-medium business, especially in tech, as a percentage of U.S. and China, the numbers are disproportionately small. Um, if, because if you look at giant companies, there are many great um, European companies. If you look at small startups that are, you know, one to ten years old, uh, the numbers in Europe are very small compared to U.S. and China. So in order to make this sustainable for Europe, to have a continuous um, set of companies and technologies that export to China and other countries, it's important to address uh, the VC and entrepreneurial ecosystem to ensure that the new ones are emerging at an appropriate percentage. Otherwise, uh, Europe has the risk of falling behind.